Hello! You can spot these rather alarming warning signs in the area surrounding Johnson Shut-In State Park in Missouri. If you hear a siren, leave the area immediately. That's what the sign says. The only question is, why? The reason is that on top of a nearby hill sits a massive man-made reservoir called Talm Sok, which once caused a local disaster. Let's take a closer look at this gigantic basin. It's about 2,100 meters long and 46 meters wide, holding an incredible 5.7 million cubic meters of water. Unfortunately, you can't go for a swim here. There isn't a single visitor in sight. The reservoir is 37 meters deep, and apart from the water itself, there's absolutely nothing inside. It's worth mentioning that this artificial reservoir was never meant for swimming. And no, it's not some massive water storage facility for all of humanity either. Maybe it's a hydroelectric power plant. Well, it does look a bit like one. Take the Hoover Dam, for example. The scale is obviously quite different. The structure on the border between Arizona and Nevada is 201 meters thick at the base and 221 meters high, creating the largest reservoir in the country. The Hoover Dam's purpose is to hold back huge volumes of water, and in that sense, it's similar to our enormous basin. But let's not drag out the suspense any longer. What we're looking at is a Pumped Storage Power Plant, or PSP for short. Not everyone knows what that is. As of 2024, there were only 43 pumped storage plants in the United States, and worldwide, as of 2010, there were about 460 such facilities. In other words, they're relatively rare. So let's start by understanding how exactly they work. The operating principle of a pumped storage power plant is similar to that of a conventional hydroelectric plant. Both generate electricity through the movement of water. However, unlike regular hydroelectric stations, a pumped storage plant consists of two separate reservoirs, one positioned higher than the other, with pump turbines located somewhere in between. At the Tom Sock facility, the upper reservoir sits on top of a mountain. That's the massive basin we've been talking about. The lower reservoir, though, is a bit harder to spot. It lies 230 meters below on the Black River and is connected to the upper basin by a 2,100 meter long tunnel drilled through the mountain. The key feature that sets pumped storage plants apart from most other types of power generation, including standard hydroelectric stations, is their ability to easily adapt to fluctuating electricity demand throughout the day. Take an ordinary city, for instance. In the morning and evening, electricity consumption spikes. People are at home, using their computers, washing machines, microwaves, stoves, and countless other electric devices. At night, people are asleep, and during the day, they're often at work so overall demand drops significantly. Engineers saw an opportunity in this, and that's how pumped storage systems were conceived. During peak demand, the station opens its gates, allowing water from the upper reservoir to flow down through the pipes into the lower one. As it passes through the turbines, the flow generates electricity. Essentially, it's the same process as in any hydroelectric power plant, with one key difference. When electricity demand is low, the turbines switch into reverse mode and pump the water back up into the upper reservoir using cheap, off-peak electricity. Why is this so valuable in today's world? Because nuclear power plants don't handle rapid changes in output very well. In fact, making sudden adjustments to their operation can be dangerous. Pumped storage systems, on the other hand, are perfect companions to renewable energy sources. When the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, the excess electricity generated by solar panels and wind turbines is used to pump water back up to the top reservoir. In short, these are essentially giant batteries. But the Tamsok plant stands apart from most others of its kind. Tamsok operates as an open-loop, pure pumping station. Unlike some pump storage plants, it has no natural inflow feeding the upper reservoir no river or stream to draw from. This means it functions solely as a consumer of electricity. And according to the laws of thermodynamics, it takes more energy to pump the water uphill than the system can generate when it flows back down. Still, the plant remains economically viable because it pumps water to the upper basin at night when electricity across the grid is cheap and plentiful. Typically, reservoirs are built in naturally convenient locations, valleys, canyons, or other places shaped by nature to hold water efficiently. But Union Electric Company decided to take a different approach. They built the upper reservoir of the Town Sock plant on what was essentially a flat mountaintop. Back in 1953, while scouting for a suitable site, 
the company focused on areas where they could minimize the size of the storage basin, yet still achieve a strong waterhead. Ultimately, they chose the highest point in Missouri, which provided a vertical drop of about 230 meters. The resulting water pressure was so great that it actually exceeded that of the Hoover Dam, the very one we mentioned earlier. In short, the decision made perfect engineering sense. When Taumsock went online in 1963, it was nothing short of revolutionary, at least for the United States. With a total peak output of 350 megawatts, it boasted the highest head pressure in the nation. On top of that, it was described as the world's first large-scale pumped storage power plant. After several upgrades, the facility's two reversible turbines were brought to a capacity of 225 megawatts each. You might think remote control systems were a recent invention, but even back in the mid-20th century, Tom Sock could be operated from a distance of 90 to 120 miles away. And the engineers didn't stop there. In 2005, the plant was upgraded to allow fully automatic operation. But despite all that modern technology, 2005 was also the year of the disaster you've probably seen in viral videos online, the dam breach. It was dramatic but also terrifying, an event that could have had truly catastrophic consequences for the entire surrounding area. Here's what happened. In a single moment, a section of the dam wall gave way, releasing the entire contents of the upper reservoir. How long did it take? Just 12 minutes. Naturally, the torrent was devastating. A massive wave of water from the mountaintop basin rushed downhill, sweeping away everything in its path. Trees, rocks, soil, leaving behind a stripped, barren channel leading straight from the upper reservoir to the state park below. By sheer luck, the breach happened in winter, when the park was almost empty. Only the superintendent and his family were there, and though their house was swept away by the flood, they miraculously survived without serious injuries. Just imagine what could have happened if that torrent had hit a populated area. Fortunately, it didn't. Thanks to the natural shape of the terrain, the floodwaters eventually poured safely into the Black River. Naturally, an investigation followed. The task was assigned to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. It's worth noting that in most such cases, the cause usually comes down to a series of small human oversights or natural factors. But in the case of the Townsauk plant, the fault lay squarely with human error. Let's start with the structure itself. The reservoir walls weren't made entirely of concrete, like you might imagine from typical dam footage. Instead, they consisted of an earthen embankment lined with concrete on the inside. As investigators later discovered, too much soil had been used in the embankment, causing excessive settlement over time. On top of that, the weaker sections of ground at the base hadn't been properly reinforced. Together, these issues led to the gradual sinking of a section of the dam. In some spots, the parapet wall that later collapsed sat half a meter lower than intended. Now remember that the plant was operated remotely. Someone miles away was pressing the buttons to release or pump water. The system relied on wall-mounted sensors to monitor water levels and prevent overflow. And here's where another critical mistake emerged. During installation, workers failed to account for the fact that part of the wall had settled lower than the rest. As a result, the sensors were no longer measuring the true water level inside the reservoir. So, water kept spilling over that sunken section again and again until erosion undermined the dam and caused its eventual collapse in 2005. To make matters worse, the reservoir lacked a natural spillway, a built-in channel that could have safely released excess water before it reached a dangerous level. After all the investigations and a $10 million fine from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the Ameren UE company was also ordered to pay an additional $180 million to the state. The destroyed park was partially restored. Today, the only reminders of that terrifying event are the warning signs telling visitors to evacuate if an alarm sounds and the path carved by the torrent of water. As for the Town Sock Upper Reservoir, the footage we've shown earlier reflects its current state. The basin was completely rebuilt at a cost of $490 million. This time, the engineers vowed not to repeat the mistakes of the past. The new structure was built as a single, solid mass of roller-compacted concrete. The result is a much stronger reservoir, one that has even earned the title of the largest roller-compacted concrete dam in the world. More than a dozen surveillance cameras were installed around the perimeter, and the design now includes a spillway to prevent uncontrolled overflow. 
On February 27, 2010, the restored reservoir was filled with water for the first time since the disaster. Everyone involved in the project watched closely as the water level was repeatedly raised and lowered to test the structure's stability. Everything went smoothly, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission gave its final approval. The Townsock pumped storage plant generated electricity once again on April 21, 2010, its first output since the 2005 failure. That's all for now, friends. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up, share your thoughts in the comments, and see you next time.